So now that we've sort of gone really big picture on the geography, right, a regional band, and then we got more narrow to a village, a calle. Now we can go even more narrow to kind of the smallest level of geography we can think of in traditional Dinaina society, which is the nichil, uh, the home. And these homes were these um, wooden structures, right, built partially into the ground. You can still see their depressions in many area. Uh, relatively large, um, 20 to 30 feet by 30 to 40 is one um, example. And they would be the home often of the elderly grandparents, um, unmarried adult children, uh, sometimes couples that are still there because it's an avunculocal or matrilocal situation, uh, as well as, you know, grandchildren or different things. And so you'd have this kind of larger extended family relationship going on in the home, a kind of situation that um, for some of us may have been very familiar growing up, um, for some of us may be very different than what we experienced growing up but w which worked very well for Dinaina society as sort of your foundational unit. Um, of course, there could also be immediate families just in a nutshell, but often it was this extended family, although still starting with a marriage, right, between the who would eventually become the grandparents and a marriage that typically followed, again, this pattern of clan exogamy. So marrying outside the family, or sorry, outside the clan and moiety exogamy. Um, and that not always, but somewhat often, followed a cross-cousin pattern. Again, your father's um, sister's child or your mother's brother's child. Um, that's a form of marriage that might seem unusual to some um, listeners, depending on one's cultural background. Uh, in the United States, first cousin marriage is, of course, uh, not legal. Uh, having said that, one should understand, and it's very important to understand, uh, that societies historically across human cultures have varied tremendously with their feelings about which is, um, if cousins are too close to be married or not. And there are many, many societies found throughout the world, um, indigenous Americas, uh, various parts of South Asia, various parts of Southwest Asia, and many other places as well, um, obviously Europe, where cross-cousin marriage or other types of cousin marriage would be perfectly acceptable and something that happened on a somewhat regular basis, again, not the only, uh, but on a somewhat regular basis. Um, and it, the fact that, though, that there's even a distinction here between cross-cousin and parallel cousin, where parallel cousins would very much be viewed as somebody you do not marry, and cross-cousins, again, father's sister's child or mother's brother's child, um, are marryable, that just shows you the tremendous variation that there is in human cultures with how we think about relatives, right? With how we think about who's related to who and what it means to be closely related to somebody, which I find very interesting. Um, I wanted to make a brief mention of division of labor um, within a traditional niche. Some of these would be relatively obvious in the sense that they're relatively common. So, for example, it was more common for um, the adult men, and especially the adult men that were not elderly, uh, to go hunting together. It would be, um, and then do other tasks as well. Um, it would be common for the women in a specific niche um, to do things like cooking together, for example, preparing food. I should be noted um, that the elder woman in the specific home uh, was in charge entirely of food distribution and that the home, in a sense, was owned by that woman. And so that's an important kind of understanding. And so um, in one of the old ethnographies, they talk about like interviewing people about gender and, you know, which gender is more powerful in your society, what's the relationship there. Um, and people at the time, this was back in the early 1900s, reporting some people saying men and then other people saying women. You know, women control everything in the home, right? They control all the food. It doesn't get much more foundational than that. Um, also, the matriarch of the home would also have a very strong say, not like an arrange, like a how should I say this, would have a strong say in who married whom, right? And who her daughters married. And that's significant, right? And I think also a somewhat strong role in who the sons married, but definitely a strong role in who the daughters married. So to say that somebody, say that the matriarch of the home, uh, the mom or the grandma, that she controlled um, the food within the home and she also controlled the marrying within the home and who you married out to, that's a tremendous, right? These are two like really fundamental facts of social life in a traditional calle, in a traditional village. So it's important to kind of understand this um, so that we don't 
misunderstand the fact that Kashka were usually male, although not always male, that we also understand this other aspect of what social power looked like in these communities. Um, not the same, but certainly different kinds of things going on in the society other than just kind of something we can make a straightforward judgment about. Division of labor. Um, you had, yeah, so we've talked about division of labor already, sorry. So that's a little bit about that. Um, children could be involved in a variety of different things. Kids spend a lot of the day playing, of course, like kids do in many societies. Um, once boys were old enough, they were expected particularly to haul wood and haul water. So uh, to go to the wherever the water is being procured from and bring that back, um, and more often to procure wood to make sure that there's enough for the fires, which typically the adult males would be building the fires um, so that things could happen throughout the day, not the least of which being cooking. So it's a little bit about some of what would be going on. Um, a lot of other things, obviously, as far as division of labor, uh, women would often be involved in a variety of types of technology, um, various types of weaving and crafting as well, of course. So the production of that sort of material culture side of things. Um, war was typically a male um, activity. We'll talk about war in a minute. As far as sort of what daily life in a village or in a chill specifically would have looked like, uh, it was very common, as far as we can tell, for people to rise very early. Sort of this idea that it is good and awesome and wonderful to arise with the dawn, that there was something wonderful about that. And indeed, there's a lot of stories about sort of when young men went and spent time with their uncles. So let me back up a little bit, as I think they talked about in uh, Alan Boris's lecture. Oftentimes the mother's brother, the maternal uncle, was kind of seen more as the disciplinarian that was supposed to help the young boys get ready for life as a man, whereas the father was seen as potentially being too lenient. Anyway, when the uncle was sort of training his nephew in how to be a proper adult, he would often like throw water, on, cold water on him in the morning and like get him up really early. So there's kind of this cultural precept of arising early as being an inherently good thing. Um, another thing about daily routines that's kind of interesting and kind of different from probably what most of us are used to growing up is that there was really only one big meal, as far as we can tell, and that would be dinner. Uh, in some villages, like Soldovia traditionally, that would have been a communal meal, the entire village getting together to eat. Um, and s within... Um, and uh, Nakelka, the sort of various clan members helping to feed everybody and making sure everybody got fed. Um, and then you would kind of have this rotation system through the different families, through the different households in the village. In a lot of other villages, instead, food was eaten at home. Not with the entire village. The village was just for, you know, kind of like special occasions, like a potlatch, like a celebration. But whether it was collective or individual at the home, notable thing here is that people mainly ate dinner together, a large evening meal. Um, during the daytime, children, elderly, and according to some reports, adult women as well would graze, as one source put it, right? Kind of like snack and different things throughout the day. Um, adult males would sometimes brag about sort of, oh, we only eat dinner, right? So kind of one big meal, and for some people that might have meant fasting the whole day, and for other people that probably just meant kind of snacking here and there. Um, Supposedly, although it's a little tough to prove something like this, but supposedly back in the day, um, with the order of eating, it was that men would be served first, uh, adult males, then women, and then children, as kind of an order of, in which people got their food. Um, this slide doesn't really go anywhere like super great, so I just wanted to put it here, I guess, as part of daily village life, because uh, I think it's interesting. So you might also kind of wonder what a day looks like when somebody's not hunting or cooking or crafting or, or foraging for that matter, right? A lot of, for both men and women, right? There'd be, a, and particularly women, a considerable amount of time foraging plant materials, foraging berries. But what about when you're not doing that? What about when you're not doing sort of the necessities of life? There's a significant amount of time where you're not, right? So you get up in a traditional village with the dawn, you get ready, you probably spend a lot of the daylight hours working, but all reports would indicate that people definitely get done working, right, around certainly by the time the sun's going down, if not earlier. So what do you do with the rest of that time before you go to bed? Um, 
there was all sorts of different ways in which entertainment happened in villages, probably the biggest of which was just storytelling. Interestingly, well, storytelling predominantly happened in the winter, where you would gather to listen to people tell their stories, the stories they knew. That would predominantly happen in the winter. It was sometimes viewed by some that the summer was just too busy, right? You were too busy fishing. So people would oftentimes sort of, there's kind of this rhythm to life where people would spend the winters in these very permanent villages with these very permanent niche or houses. They would spend sort of October through April, right? Basically when it's starting to snow all the way through breakup of the river ice um, in kind of a permanent winter village. And then during the summer, people would spend a lot of time in kind of less permanent villages, for lack of a better word, um, less well-built shelters, less permanent shelters off at like a fish camp, or then, you know, they spent a few weeks at a fish camp and then a few weeks at a hunting camp, things like that. People were um, a little bit more moving around to make use of different kinds of resources and they were busy. They were busy putting up fish for the entire winter. That was essentially a huge chunk of your food during the winter um, when snow is covering all the forage, right? And obviously you can't fish for a whole lot during the winter. So, um, so then during the winter then is when storytelling happened because people were just too busy during the summer. And I put here a note, one for each day. What I'm trying to get at there is it was considered a prized sort of valued thing for somebody to have lots of stories. And indeed, it was kind of a brag to be, you know, a flex to be able to say that you had a story for every single day of the winter season, you know, that you could tell a different story every night from October through April. Um, other people maybe just had a few stories, but it was a, something that people did, right? Sit around the fire, talk tell stories, learn about your past as a people. And I want us to kind of conceptualize that and get in that mind space because it is so unlike what a lot of us, some of us may have experienced something like that, but a lot of us didn't growing up, right? Um, during the evening, you get home, you do your, from your long day of school and sports or clubs uh, and then homework, you maybe have a meal with your family up perhaps, right, and talk and different things, uh, but you kind of, a lot of times, you're going about your different stuff in the evening, you know, maybe some people are watching TV, some people go upstairs to, you know, listen to music, whatever. Here, it's a very kind of collective experience of sitting around and listening to stories in the evening. Um, another thing that would happen in the evening is that very often the men would go down to beaches or other common areas and engage in all sorts of different sports um, and games. There's a lot of different kinds of sports that people did at the time. Um, this one game that's essentially like a disc toss, you had kind of like a round um, wooden that you um, disc sort of thing that you threw at basically stakes in the ground to see who would get the closest. Um, stick pull was another very common one. So basically like um, two people would have a stick between them and be seated down and kind of like their feet against each other and then trying to pull the other one over. Tug of war, another really common one. Obviously not called tug of war back then. Many different sports, you know, and it's really interesting to see kind of a convergent evolution here. And what I mean by that is that many, many cultures have come up with like very similar kinds of games, right? Because they're kind of like a logical type of game. Although interestingly, sometimes they don't. So for example, one ethnographer points out that as far as they could tell, tag wasn't played traditionally. So kind of interesting. Um, another common one from it, sometimes there was also like joking games. So another one where like um, the person playing would like, typically an adult man would have his uh, head blindfolded and then sort of um, be trying to tag, but not like in the traditional sense of tag where everybody can see each other, but trying to get the other people. Uh, and typically during this, at one some point they'd fall down, maybe fall in the fire. They'd usually wear something so they don't get burned or something and everybody'd have a good laugh. So there's all sorts of different sports and games. And I want to bring this up partly because it's just cool to learn, but partly because I think sometimes when we think about hunter-gatherer societies traditionally, we can forget a, that people had leisure time. In some cases, they had more leisure time than you or I have, right? More leisure time than sort of a 50-hour work week might accommodate or a 50-hour work plus school week. And also to suggest that people's lives were rich and complex and they didn't just consist of how they put food in their mouth, right? Um, there was also a variety of like children's toys. So dolls, uh, small wooden dolls basically were common. Um, small replicas of a chill, especially for um, young girls. Um, other things too, a spinning top basically, but it was like a all, like a stick that was through like a round piece of wood and it basically acted like what you would think of as like a top. Um, all sorts of different kinds of toys that were used as well for like, like 
there were kids, right? And they weren't just hunting all the time. Like, kids did what kids do and have fun. So I think that's just kind of a part of our common human experience that's worth bringing up that people have got to figure out a way uh, to not just be working all the time. Um, a quick note on gender. As I said before, historically, most Geshka were male. Apparently, all hunting chiefs were male. But again, that kind of like position under the Geshka where somebody helps figure out what's going on with the hunting. Um, however, women could be Geshka in theory, from what we know. And also, they could definitely be shamans, streamers, sky readers, Kechotani, basically all these different spiritual practitioners within Danaina society. Um, this follows a trend that we actually see in several Native American societies where it is more common for males to be holding certain kinds of positions, such as certain kinds of spiritual leader positions, but it is definitely open to people of both or several genders. Um, so that's an interesting trend that we can observe. Another thing to point out about gender is that there was a 40-day postnatal semi-seclusion. What I mean by that is after having a, a child, a woman would kind of go into um, like a shelter built for this purpose and then kind of have her own space with the baby for about 40 days where men were, for the most part, not supposed to visit from what we could tell from the histories. Um, instead, other women in the village could stop by and things like that, which is interesting, right? This follows a pattern that we see in a lot of societies of recognition of the fact that a baby is very, very fragile when they are first born, very, very fragile to germs and different things. And so many cultures have some way of isolating either the mom and baby or mom and dad and baby or whatever the case may be um, and we would presume at least partly as a way of protecting the baby at a time of fragile health and protecting the mom at a time of fragile health and recovery as well. Um, there was also pretty elaborate um, rites of passage. We don't um, puberty ceremonies to recognize uh, when girls were being recognized by the village as a woman, when boys were being recognized by the village as a man. We don't know a lot about the male um, rite of passage. The male puberty ceremony is something that we just don't have a lot of good data on, and it had, was not around anymore, essentially, once anthropologists were going around being nosy idiots and asking too many questions. It was not really practiced anymore. Um, female ceremonies we know more about. We know that traditionally, again, pre-colonialism or early on in colonialism, um, young women would have a ceremony around the time of puberty, um, and they would spend a year in what we could call a liminal state. Um, so if you're not familiar with that term, it's from Vic Turner's theory, and as well as Van Gennep's earlier theory. But the idea that in rites of passage, when we have ceremonies that mark a transition, such as becoming an adult, that these ceremonies oftentimes have a separation from the old role and then a reintegration into a new role. But in between, there's kind of this liminal period where you don't really have any set role in a society. You're kind of in this fluid in-between space. Usually a lot of education happens and a lot of character building. Indeed, in some societies, such as the Ndembu um, of Central Africa with the Makunda ceremony, it's actually seen as sort of building a person into an adult. And that, they, that becoming an adult is not just a biological matter, but that you have to go through a ceremony to get that learning to become that person. So in specifically Danina society, though, um, women for a year were kind of in a liminal state. Uh, the girl was in kind of this liminal state um, where, for one thing, she spent a lot of time sort of semi-secluded from other people in the village. Um, she also would drink from a different straw, like a straw. Um, specifically for people that were going through this ceremony. And there were other things, um, how she dressed, other things that kind of marked somebody apart as somebody going through this, um, I would say, sacred time of sort of transformation and of um, growing up. All right, well, having talked about kind of life in the village, I now kind of want to shift into talking about kinship. So I'll pause here. <laughs>